Welcome to today's webinar, Leapfrog Geothermal Best Practice, Building a Geological Model Without Well Data. My name is Bastian Pooks. I am Technical Sales Advisor for Energy at Sequent. It is my pleasure to host you for this webinar. Please note, the objective of this webinar is to focus on the tools in Leapfrog Geothermal and to give you helpful workflow ideas and tips and tricks to elevate your modeling skills. The material covered in this webinar is meant to be high level and is using a simplified dataset. Thanks to its powerful implicit modeling engine, Leapfrog Geothermal allows you to build complex geological models directly from your data. Its fast processing and dynamic updating capabilities lets you easily build models from different types of data and update them quickly as new data are integrated. This best practice webinar will focus on the elaboration of a geological model without well data. Instead, we will be using geological cross-sections and a surface geological map. We will learn how to import and properly digitize the geological map and the cross-sections. For such process, it is important to have a well-established workflow following a logical order of actions to make sure we keep this modeling exercise quick, simple, and easily replicable. We will use some key tools of Leapfrog Geothermal to build the most representative geological model from the data available. During this video, a couple tips and tricks will be presented and explained to you, such as when and how to use polylines, GIS lines, or structural disks to digitize surface maps and cross-sections. Also, we will see how the boundary filter, which is used to filter the data defining a surface in different blocks, can be controlled and how it affects the geological model. We are now in Leapfrog Geothermal. I have created a new project for this presentation. As a reminder, you have on the left the project tree with all the tools of Leapfrog. In the middle, the 3D scene. Below the 3D scene is the shape list. And finally, at the bottom right is the property panel. And above the 3D scene, we have the toolbar. The first thing we're going to do is import the topography. For this, I right-click on my topography folder, new topography, from an elevation grid. I will then browse into my folder, where is my topography file, and I open it. I will keep my default resolution of 100. It is clipped to the bounding box. I can now import my topography. The topography is going to appear below the topography's folder, and I can drag it into the scene. At the moment, it is using a flat color. But if I go into the drop down menu in my shape list, I can select elevation. The color ramp now is from blue to red, but I can also change it in the next drop down menu by clicking the pencil. On the top left, under gradient, you can select a different color ramp. We'll take here the linear one from green to white. The next thing we are going to do is import the geological map. I right click on my GIS data maps and photos folder and I select import map. I can open my geological map. Here it is in TIFF format. The map is shown under the GIS data maps and photo folders. If I drag this one in, it doesn't have any elevation information. So what I have to do after I remove this one from the shape list under the topography, in the drop-down menu, I will select my map, geological map, which is going to be draped directly on my topography. Here we can see that we have three different lithologies on the surface geological map, one possible uh, intrusion on the right in red, some alluviums, and the basement in purple. The next thing we're going to do is we're going to import the cross-sections in the cross-sections and contours folder from an image. I have two available here, so I'm going to start by importing the east-west one. I click open. It is now here under my cross-section folder in the project tree, and I can drag it in my scene. As you can see, this is a vertical cross-section. I can do the same thing with the second cross-section. Right-click on the cross-section folder from image. In this one, I pick the north-south one and I'm going to drag it into the scene. Now we can see those two cross sections which are perpendicular to each other. 
For our first tip and tricks, we're going to see how to properly digitize the faults and lithological contacts on a geological map. There are three main tools that we can use, either separately or together. The polylines, the GIS lines, and the structural disks. Polylines have a polarity, shown by the red and blue ribbon, but also a direction, also called tangent, whereas GIS lines don't have any of those. Structural disks, however, have a polarity, a dip, and an azimuth which is equivalent to a direction for a plane. A GIS line plus structural disks is the equivalent of a polyline. The issue with polylines is that they don't get projected or draped on the topography, which results in an approximated contact on the surface. This is particularly true if the topography is quite important in the area, like on the image on the right, and if the distance between the points is longer. Note that you can extract a GIS line from a polyline by right-clicking on it. When you draw a GIS line, LeapFrog automatically generates a GIS line on topography, which you can combine with structural disks to fit exactly the topography and also give an orientation to your surface. Additionally, it is easier to modify structural disks, azimuth and dip, than polyline tangents when you need to make modifications to your surfaces. So we are going to create a new GIS line in the GIS data maps and photos folder. Right click and you go to new GIS line from a new drawing. We would start here by default number one, which is the one on the left. We are going to zoom in a bit on the fault number one. The editing tools are above the scene. So we're going to select the pencil to draw a line. And we have two options. Either we can draw on a slicer or we can draw on an object in the scene, which would be here our topography. So we're going to select the second option. As you can see, when there is no object, I can no draw, but as soon as I get on my geological map, I can. And I'm going to digitize the line by clicking with the left button of my mouse. And when I reach the end point, I use the right click of my mouse to stop editing. Once I'm done drawing my fault, I can save and close the editing tool. My fault one is under my GIS objects, but automatically, it has also created a draped fault 1 on topography. I can now digitize my fault 2 with the exact same process. I right click on my GIS data, new line, from a new drawing. This one will be fault number 2. I also select my pencil and I click on drawing on an object. I cannot start digitizing my line from the top to the bottom or the other way around until the intersection with the other fault. Right click on my mouse to stop editing. I save and I can close the drawing tool. We now have digitized two of the faults as you can see here and we have two more to go. I will create fault number three the same way, new GIS line from a new drawing. Name it fault number three. Now I use my pencil and I draw an object, same process. And I can digitize the fault now on the geological map. I save and I close the drawing tool. Finally, I have one fault left to digitize, which is the range front fault. And I use my pencil and I draw on an object. If you hold the left button after a click, you can control the curvature of your line. This process can make it easier to digitize faults that are turning we go all the way to the end of this fault and I right click to stop drawing. I have now digitized my four faults. Can save the last one. Can reactivate my topography. Now, the four faults that I just digitized are also under the draped GIS objects, which means that they are exactly draped onto the topography. I'm going to put those into my scene and I'm going to remove the four faults that are not on topography. If I wanted to edit those faults, I would have to edit those that are not draped on topography. The faults that we see here are clearly draped onto the topography. As explained earlier, even though here the topography is pretty flat, this is the most accurate way to match a line or a contact on surface. The faults are also present in the cross sections and this will be used to build the fault surfaces. But first, we have to digitize them 
we're going to start with the east-west cross section. A small trick here is to make sure your slicer is activated and then go into the shape list, click on it and in the property panel you can select set to the east-west cross section. I now press L on my keyboard to face directly my cross section. Here we have fault 1, 2 and 3 to digitize and for that we are going to use polylines. So in my project tree I can go into my polylines folder I right click and I'm select new polyline to start drawing. This one will be fault number 1 to start with. I can also select here in the toolbox my pencil but this time instead of choosing drawing on the object I'm going to draw on the slicer. So I select the one with the yellow box and I can start digitizing it. Note that here I start from the surface and then I right click to stop digitizing. What is important with polylines, as I explained earlier, is that it includes a polarity shown here by a ribbon, which I'm going to make a bit larger. There is on the polyline a red side and a blue side. The right side indicates the direction the fault is dipping to. So here I have to revert it. I highlight it by double clicking and I select this icon in the toolbox to invert the polarity of the line. And then I can save and stop drawing for the fault number one. The next fault we're going to draw is the fault number two. Same process, I create a new polyline called fault number two. But this time you're going to see that I'm going to draw the fault starting from the bottom toward the surface. This is pretty much a straight line. And as you can see on the ribbon, let's make it a bit thicker, the right side already indicates the dipping direction of the fault. This is due to the way I've drawn the line from depth to surface. I can save and stop drawing for the fault number two. The last fault to do is the fault number three. Create a new polyline for the fault number three. Click OK and now I can digitize it on my cross section. I'm going to start here from the top to the bottom. I click right on my mouse when I'm done drawing. I'm going to make the ribbon a bit thicker to see it. And if I had the cross section, I can see that uh, the polarity of the line is correct. Don't forget to save. And then we can close the drawing tool. We have not digitized the faults on this cross section. What we're going to have to do is to digitize the last fault, the range front fault, on the north-south cross section. I will set my slicer to this cross section, so I go to set to in the property panel and I select cross section north-south and then I press L on my keyboard to look directly at the cross section. The same workflow as I did for the fault 1, 2 and 3. I'm going to create a new polyline. This is for my range front fault and then I'm going to select the pencil on my cross section and I will draw the line on the section. This is a pretty straight line so I'm just going to do one point in the middle and that should be good. Let's check the ribbon and the polarity of the line. Put some transparency and we can see that the right side is indicating the direction of the dip. We can save and close the drawing tool. We have now digitized our four faults and we're going to start digitizing the lithologies. For our second tips and tricks in this video, we will see which lithological contacts must be digitized on the geological map. If you prefer to build your surfaces from the youngest to the oldest, which is the case for most users, then you are using the contacts below when building a deposit or an erosion surface. In this case, you only need to digitize the contacts with all the lithologies on surface. The opposite, if you usually build your surfaces from the oldest to the youngest, then you are using the contacts above when building a deposit or an erosion surface. In this case, you only need to digitize the contacts with the younger lithologies on surface. If you were to digitize the complete contours of each lithology on surface, you would end up with these bubbles of lithologies with no relation to each other, like you can see on the picture on the right. But if done correctly, you will be able to successfully represent the chronological relations between the lithologies, as you can see on the updated image now on the right. We will start with the youngest lithology, which is the basalt. So we're going to create a new GIS line that's going to be named basalt. The basalt is in contact with the oldest lithology. So here it's in the yellow, it's the alluvium. So that's the only contact we're going to do here. And then click OK. We're going to select 
the pencil and we're going to be drawing on an object and then we can start digitizing. You can use the Bezier point to control the curvature of your line and when you reach the end point, right click and then you can save and stop the drawing tool. We are then going to digitize the second contact that we can see on the geological map which is the contact between the alluviums and the basement. So we are also going to create a new GIS line from your drawing and this one is going to be called alluvium because the alluvium is the youngest lithology. And then we can start digitizing using the pencil and we make sure we are drawing on the object. We can also use the Bezier point if you want to follow the curvature and then you right click when it's finished. You can save. If we remove the topography, we can see the two contacts that we just digitized, the basalt and the alluvions. We save and we stop the drawing tool. Now we're going to do the same thing as we did for the folds earlier, where we digitize using GIS lines on surface and polylines on the cross section. We're going to reactivate the east west cross section and we're going to start digitizing the liturgical contact. So, first we set the slicer to this east west cross section and we press L on the keyboard to face it. And here, the youngest lithology is the bazaar. There, we can see this magma chimney on the right. So, we're going to create a new polyline in the polyline folder, new polyline, and this is going to be the basalt. We're going to have the toolbox at the top and we're going to select the pencil, but this time we will select the yellow icon, the one that means that we're going to draw on the cross section. So, we're going to digitize the line. We can use the Bezier point to control the curvature and you go all the way to the bottom of the magma chimney. And then you're going to start on the other side of the lithology up to the surface. And then you can save because the ribbon are on the right side, the right was inside. And we're going to close. We're going to have to do the same thing with the other contacts. So first is in yellow, the alluviums. We create a new polyline for the alluviums. This is going to be pretty simple as it is a straight line. So I use my pencil on my cross section and I'm going to draw a line from the left all the way to uh, where it meets with the basaltic intrusions and then I'm going to restart on the other side. And when that is done, I can save and close. The next lithology is the andesic tuff in orange in contact with the andesitic pressure. So I'm going to create a new polyline that's going to be called the andesic tuff. And now we can start digitizing on the cross section. So we have to stop a bit before the fold, right click, and then we'll start the next section, right click before the fold. So we're going to have four different segments. We can see that the red is on the top, so on the youngest lithology, so the ribbon is on the right position. And then we go all the way after the intrusion and right click, and then we can save. If you don't remember which lithology is the next, you'll still have the legend of your cross section. Right. So we're going to stop the drawing tool, and then we're going to do the next contact, which is the andesitic brescia, which is the last contact. It is younger than the basement, so we use the pencil on the cross section, and we're going to digitize the contact between the andesitic brescia and the basement in the four different sections in between folds and then we can save. So what we have done now is we have digitized the contact on one of the cross section, but we also have to do it on the second one. So we're going to start by setting the slicer to the north-south cross section this time, and press L on the keyboard to look directly at it. Here we only have three contacts. The basalt is not present in this area. I'm going to put some transparency so we can see the ribbons. But this time we will not create new polylines, we will reuse the existing one for the alluvium, for the anesthetic tough and the anesthetic pressure. So in my shape list I can look for my alluvium and I click on the pencil so that I reactivate the drawing tool. And I'm going to be drawing my alluvium contact 
on the cross section. The right side of the ribbon indicates the youngest lithology, which in this case is the alluvium. We save. We're going to do the same thing for the endesic tuff. So we click on the endesic tuff in the shape list, click on the pencil, and we start drawing a new polyline. This is a straight line, so it's pretty easy. The ribbon is on the top, on the right side. We can save. And I'm going to do the same thing for the last contact, which is the endesic brescia. Click on the pencil. I'm going to start drawing a new polyline, which is also a straight line. Pretty easy to draw here. And then we save and close the drawing tool. So now we have digitized all the contacts on the two sections. We have also digitized the fault, which we can put back the polylines. So this would now be used to create a new geological model. So we're going to clear the scene. We're going to look for the geological modeling folder. Right click, new geological model. What we see here is the boundary box in which we're going to be building our geological model. So we're going to put in the, the topography to make sure we match the boundaries with the geological map. So we're going to use the red arrows to extend it a little bit on the sides. For the depth of the model, what we're going to do is we're going to fit the depth of the cross section. So we're going to slide in one of the cross section. And we can see that they were going to minus 1000 meter. So for the minimum depth, I will put minus 1000. For the resolution, we're going to use 100. And then we are going to rename geological model. And we click OK. So this is going to create our geological model. Once the processing is done, we see the typical five objects that constitute a geological model. So this is the boundary where we're going to build our geological model. We have the fault system, the lithologies. Because we're not using any well data, currently there is no lithology considered for this geological model. So what we're going to have to do is to create those lithologies. All the infos are available on the cross sections. So we have five lithologies. We will start by the first one, so the alluvium. So I add a new lithology and I type it alluvium. I can change the color and I can use the eyedropper to use exactly the same color as in the legend of my cross section. And I click OK. We can do the same thing for the other lithologies. So the anesthetic brescia, use the eyedropper, then the anesthetic tuff. the basement and every time I use the eyedropper to have exactly the same color as in my cross section legend and finally the basalt and then we click OK so we are now set to start creating the surfaces for the different lithologies I'm going to clean the scene and we're going to start by creating our first surface which is going to be the basalt we're going to use for that the GIS contour on surface as well as the polyline we digitize on the cross section. So using those two objects, we're going to be able to build a surface. For the basalt, we will build the surface as an intrusion. So we select new intrusion, and we're going to start building it from the polyline or the GIS. So we can start with the one we want and then add the second one later on. So we're going to start with the polyline. Our first lithology is the basalt. And because it is in contact with other lithologies, we're going to leave the second lithology as unknown. Now we're going to use an existing polyline and we can go in the drop down menu to select the basalt one and click OK. So this will build the basalt surface, which right now is just using the polyline. So what we need to do is to also add the GIS line. For that, I can right click on my basalt and I will add the GIS vector data. In this window, I can select the basal contour on topography. It's very important to select the one that's on topography. So it's going to reprocess the surface. And when it's finished, I will see it in the scene. So it is now more coherent 
with my data, but there's still a few spots where it is not exactly matching. And this is where we're going to have to add the structural disk to control this surface. So I can either create my structural disk in my structural modeling folder and then import them in my surface, or I can directly right click on my surface and click edit with structural data. So we're going to create new structural disks here. In the toolbar, I will see the disk icon to create new disk and similarly to the GS line, I will create them on uh, the 3D object, which is here my topography. The camera plunge and azimuth is going to define the deep and azimuth of my structural disk that I'm going to draw. So I select the tool to draw a disk and I'm going to go on the line and draw a disk here. Right now it's pretty small so I can make them a bit bigger so that you can see them better. And now we see the two disks with the red and the blue side and I can add a bunch of them all around my object. It is important to turn the camera in order to change the deep and the azimuth of the disk I will draw. Now I'm drawing disk all around my basaltic unit. You can use the arrows around the disk to modify the deep and the azimuth or you can directly enter the values in the window. So I'm going to put all the disks all around the basalt. And when this is finished, you simply save. The surface is going to reprocess by including the disk. And now we can see that by using all this data together, we have the surface that we wanted to create. And I can close my drawing too. The next lithology we're going to have to create the surface for is uh, the alluvium in yellow. And for that, we have the alluvium polylines from the cross section, but we also have the alluvium contour from the geological map. So we're going to create a new deposit from a polyline. So here we're going to select as a lithology alluvium. And what is below, we're going to leave it as unknown because it is either basement or the andesitic tuff. We're going to use an existing polyline, so our alluvium polyline is going to create a first surface, but now we need to also add the GIS line to it. So we're going to right click on the deposit, add, and GIS vector data, and we're going to be looking for our alluvium contour on topography. Once the surface is reprocessed, it will appear here. So the same as the basalt, to get rid of these areas in the mountains here, what we need to do is to add some structural disks to control the dip and the azimuth of the surface at the contact. So we right click on the deposit and we're going to edit with structural data. Exactly the same as for the basalt. We're going to select the disk drawing tool. You pick the angle of camera that you want to use to draw your disk. And you can draw a disk all along the contact line. When the topography is a bit more steep, we recommend to put more disks in order to better control the surface. If we turn a bit around the scene, we can see the disks are dipping toward the alluviums. And we're going to save, it's going to reprocess the surface and adapt to the disk. So we don't have any more the yellow patches on the other side of the contact line. You can stop the drawing. The next you need to draw is the contact of the andesitic tuff on the andesitic pressure. We're going to do this one also as a deposit. So new deposit from a polyline. The first lithology is going to be the andesitic tuff and it is in contact below with the andesitic breccia. And we we'll click OK. We're going to use the existing polyline that corresponds to the andesitic tuff. And this is going to create our deposit. If 
For this one, we don't have any contact on surface, so we don't have to add any other file. If we look at the surface, we can see some steps that correspond to the fault offset. We're going to do the last contact, which is also a deposit of the basaltic breccia on the basement. For that, we're also going to reopen our existing polyline that correspond to the andesitic breccia. Our surface is created the same way. There is no other contact on surface. We can look at all the surface together. So we reactivate the alluvium one. Now we can clear the scene. We're going to do for the next step, we're going to create our fault in our geological model. As you may remember, we have four faults on surface. And we're going to start by the fault number one to generate the surface. So I right click on my fault system in my geological model and I'm going to create a new fault from the GIS data on surface. And here I can look for my fault one on topography. This is going to create the surface only from the GIS line. So it is going to be sub-vertical. What I have to do is the same way as for the lithologies. I am going to add that line that I digitize on my cross section for the fault number one. I'm going to add it to my surface by right clicking on my fault number one. I can add a polyline, and here I will look for my fault number one polyline. And I click OK. It's going to update the surface, and now you can see that the surface is matching with the polyline. So the same thing needs to be done for the fault 2, 3 and the range 1 fault. So I select my GIS object on surface and then I add my polyline for the fault. So this is fault 2 and then fault 3. We use the GIS fault 3 on topography. And we add the polyline for fault 3. So these are our three folds are oriented north-south. You can look at them without the topography. The last fold we have to add is the range front fold. So we select the GIS vector. And we also add the polyline for the range front fold by right-clicking Add Polyline. So now we have our four folds, which I'm going to color in gray. The next step is to set the chronology and their cross-cutting relation. So if you remember on the geological map, fault number one stops on fault number two, and fault number two and three also stop on the range from fault. If we double-click on the fault system, this window opens where I can set the chronology of the fault. In order to stop on fault number two, fault number one will have to be set as older, so I can click on it and set it as older. Below the fault chronology, I can set the fault interactions. If I click Add, it tells me that fault number one terminates against fault number two on the east. We see here by clicking on the fault that it should be on the west side. So I can change east by west. And if I click OK, you will see that it's going to reprocess. And now my fault number one stops on my fault number two. Now I have to do the same thing with the range front fault. So the range front fault has to be set in the chronology as the youngest fault. So I click on it and I set it as the youngest fault. So for fault number two, I will have to add an interaction that it stops on the range front fault. And this is its north side. So north, so it's all good. Do the same thing for the fault number one. Stops on range from fault on the north side and also for the fault number three. And then we click OK. So it's going to reprocess all the faults. And if we look at them, they now stop on the north side of the range from fault. We can check that everything is matching the faults on surface in the geological map with the cross sections, the east-west 
or the north-south. And it's time for the last tips and tricks. For the last tips and tricks in this webinar, we will try to get a better understanding at a very important tool in LeapFrog, the boundary filter. This tool is really useful for geological modeling once you have activated the faults, but you want some of the lithologies to not be affected by those faults. When the boundary filter is activated for some data, then the surface in a given block of your geological model is only created using the data that are inside this block. As a reminder, block boundaries are defined by faults, so this is how the faults offset is generated in your model. If you turn off the boundary filter, the surface in any given block will use all the data existing in your geological model boundary to build the surface. This setting has to be the same for each of the surfaces corresponding to the same lithology in each block. A trick consists in setting the boundary filter parameters before activating your faults so that they are all the same in each block. Additionally, there is a custom option to filter only certain types of data, for example, a set of structural disks or the well data. On the image on the right, the boundary filter is on for all the data, which includes polylines and structural disks. Surfaces in each block are created using only the section of the polyline and the structural disks within this block. Five blocks were resulting from four faults, and the five surfaces are not matching each other. But once we turn off the boundary filter for this surface in each block, all the data available are being used in each block to create the surfaces. So they look identical, even though they are cut by the block boundaries. Altogether, they match perfectly to recreate an unfaulted surface while the faults were activated. Back to our model. If we look at the cross section, we can see on this one that the alluviums are not being affected by the range front fault. In the surface chronology of our geological model, if we double click on the alluvium surface, in the second tab called surfacing, we have the boundary filter. Here it is on all data, which means that all the data are being filtered by default. So we're going to set this boundary filter to off so that it considers all the data available to build the alluvium surface. Another important thing to do is to share the structural data that we have created for this surface. This way, when we activate the faults and we want to modify the structural data, it will affect the surface in each block. When we share the file, we see that it appears inside the structural modeling data. The second lithology that we have to change the boundary filter for is the basalt. As you remember, on the surface geological map, the basalt is not affected by default number one. So we're going to double click on the basalt intrusive surface, go to the surfacing tab, and also set the boundary filter to off. And okay. This will also allow the software to use all the structural disks that we draw for this unit, whether they are in this block or in the other one. We're also going to share the structural disks, which go in the structural modeling folder. We are now ready to activate our surfaces. For that, I'm going to click on my surface chronology in my geological model. And in this window that appears, I will be saying which lithology is younger. So the basalt here is the youngest lithology, followed by the alluvium. And finally, the andesitic tuff is above the andesitic breccia. We can now tick this box to activate all the layers and click OK. The software is going to create the volumes for each of the lithology which are going to appear in this folder in the geological model object. And we see here the five units. If we drag the basement, the anzitic breccia, the tuff, the alluvium, and the basalt. Right now, it doesn't exactly match the geological map. And that's because we haven't activated the faults yet. But we can see that the chronological order of the units is in the right order. We're going to right click on the fault system now and activate all the fault by ticking the first box next to fault to activate them all. Click OK. The software is going to reprocess 
the geological model and is going to separate our geological model in different blocks. You may have this warning message that said that there is no basalt in one of the block. Simply click OK. So if we look now, we have different blocks in our geological model, each of them with the same surfaces. If I want to know how the blocks are numbered, I right-click on my geological model and I'm going to select View Fold Block Boundaries. And this will show me where the five blocks are located in my model. If I click on one of the volume, it tells me the block number. So this block here is the block number one. I can also drag my block one by one. Now what we see here in white is that in this block, one of the lithology was defined as unknown. And this is because we didn't say which lithology was below the alluvials. So if I go in the surface chronology of my block number one, and as a background lithology below the chronology, I set basement, then everything that is right now as unknown will be changed to basement lithology. And now we have the right lithology in this area. To check the accuracy of our geological model, we can drag in the topography with the geological map and we can see how the data are matching. Right now the result is pretty good. To see how the model looks at depth, we can draw a slice across our model, move around the scene, and by using the control key on your keyboard and the right click of your mouse and moving your mouse, you can move the slicer through the model. So we see here the faults and the fault offset, the basalt chimney on the right, and then we are going to reach the range front fault. We can compare it with our cross section and move the slicer to our cross section. So we can see the similarity by playing with the transparency between the cross section and the actual geological model. We can also check with the other cross section and also changing the transparency and we see that the model is matching pretty well. We're going to get back to our complete geological model, turn off the slicer. So this is the end of this video on how to build a geological model without well data. I hope that the tools and techniques shown today will be useful for you and your future modeling projects. If you have any question, please do not hesitate to contact us at support.energy at sequen.com.